had to do a survey of the parables of Jesus. And if we had to pick the top ones, um, what might they be? So think about that. The top two parables. <clears throat> I would expect the Good Samaritan would probably be one. Probably a lot of people know that one. There's probably another one that is, uh, I'm going to invite you to turn your Bibles to, as we look at Luke 15. Luke 15. Um, and I'm actually just going to begin reading in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. And you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Oh, my son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we have this other parable that likely is one of those top ones. I mean, Jesus told a lot of parables. But I'd say Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son story are probably at the top of the list. So our focus today is how do we welcome the prodigal? How do we welcome the prodigal? Uh, just a little definition. I'm not sure, Joshua. What's there? We go. The word prodigal. We we use that. We we label this the prodigal son, and and the definition is wastefully extravagant and giving something on a lavish scale. Now this is an important definition. I want you to keep in mind as we go forward. So. Jesus, we, we didn't read the first part of Luke 15 because it's important, but I'm going to refer to it in a little bit. Jesus told two other parables that set the stage for this one. And so he told those two, then he says, a man had two sons. 
So it's important. Man has two sons. So the focus for the most of the story is on the younger son, the prodigal son, the one who is wastefully extravagant. And we, we read this parable with the focus on the younger son, and, and we do that probably because we may identify with this younger boy, that we've not always lived in the father's household as we ought that we have wasted time, that we look for happiness in other places. And one day we wake up and there we are in a pig pen. I, I used to say, because you know, part of my life I raised hogs and, and I always said that was not mud on the boy's feet. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> We squander our lives apart from our Heavenly Father. So the focus today is on the welcome that the younger son receives. Now, we focus on the reception the father gave him, but remember Jesus said he had two sons. Both of them welcomed the boy home in, in quite a different way. So it's important to think about this in the way that we welcome guests into our church. The way we welcome people in our lives as we show Christ's love to the world around us. How, how, do we do, how, do, how good are we at doing that? So let's look at the Father's welcome. And, and if you read, read that parable closely, it's almost like every day the father stood on the front porch and looked down that long lane, waiting, anticipating, waiting for the boy to come home. And, and then one day he saw him. Now I'm sure he looked a lot different than when he left. But he saw his son. And what this father did next is something that historians tell us no self-respecting elder man in that Middle Eastern culture would do. Because, you know, they, they wore long robes. He would have to have hiked the hem of his robe up, showing his bare legs, which is taboo. And he ran to the boy. And, and he embraced him and kissed him. And, and look at all the things that he uh, does. I mean, he doesn't even wait to hear the boy's apology. The boy only gets half of his apology out. I, I heard that Jack Hayford, who was a nationally known pastor, spoke at, a, at a, I think it was Promise Keepers one time, and he said, what I think happened is that the boy started his apology and the father put his hand over his mouth. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Bring the best robe. Now, I see into this, he covers the dirt of the world, but it was also reserved for the guest of honor. He put a ring on his finger, a symbol of sonship. With that ring, he restored him as his son, also a symbol of authority. Sandals. Sandals on his feet. And you know, what the boy want to do? Come back and be a slave. Slaves didn't wear sandals. Sons did. And then he killed the fatted calf. Reserved for only the most special of occasion. It was party time because the son was home and the father came, uh, welcomed him home because he had come to himself. So remember the definition of prodigal that was... Uh, being, uh, being, giving something on a lavish scale. I'd say the father did that. The father could be the prodigal father. And we could almost say that God is a prodigal God because He lavishes on us so much. So much. You see, this party was important because this is how God sees prodigals coming home. 
when Jesus told the previous two parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin, there was a celebration. And the purpose of those two parables was to emphasize the celebration that took place. A celebration over a lost sheep found and a lost coin found. And, and Jesus said this about those two, that there's something of greater significance that happens in heaven that there is joy in heaven when a sinner comes home. This is the point of the parables. And that's important. That's how God sees prodigals returning home to Him and in the church. So there's two welcomes. The older son, the older brother. He was out working in the field like a good son should be. He wasn't out squandering time and money. And when he heard the party and he found out what was going on, he wouldn't have any part of it. I'm not going in to celebrate this lost person. It, it would be like I've condoned what he has done. Sometimes we think about that with lost people, that if I show them some welcome or some attention, it's like I'm condoning what they've done. So he says, no way. And then Jesus says the father comes out. Comes out to plead with the son to come in and celebrate his brother's return. Did you, you read into that? This son of yours comes home and then the father says, but this brother of yours is home safe and sound. And so he argues with, with the father. He reports that all of his good works, I've slaved for you. I've never disobeyed one of your commands. Do you think the father went, <laughs> yeah. I'm the good son, remember? There was a root of bitterness in all that, wasn't there? Because I'm so good and you never threw even a little party with a goat for me and my friends. Now this son of yours comes home who has wasted all your property on wild living and you kill the prize calf. It's always occurred to me that when the younger son took off, he would have gotten a third of the estate. The elder got double. So the older brother would have, dad would have signed over two-thirds of everything to him and a third to the younger son. Now if there was livestock and property and all that, how do you think the boy survived in a different country? I've always thought that he probably went to his brother and said, hey, buy me out. Give me some cash. It's not in there, but it, it, it kind of makes sense. And so who owns it all right now? The older brother. He owns it all. So the, the father pleads with the son, but in the end we're left to wonder if he ever came in, which I doubt that he did. So what's the point of this parable? Well, when we go back to the very beginning, verses 1 and 2, we read, this is the context for these three parables. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. So Jesus hears all this. See, Jesus was fulfilling God's mission. The mission of reaching out and welcoming the lost. And, and the mission of Jesus should be the mission of God's people, right? See, God had chosen the Jews to be His people, not so they could dwell on their, their special status and look at the halo over our heads, not to feel superior to anyone who wasn't a Jew. Remember God told Abraham that through him and his descendants all the world would be blessed? God had a mission for them. Isaiah 49, 6, I will also appoint you as a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. 
But the Pharisees had never got any farther than the Jordan River. It never left that little piece of property, Israel. That's sad that they, they had this wonderful mission. See, it was God's intention that the Jews would reach out to others for Him. So Jesus holds up a mirror to these, to these folks who are muttering around Him. And He tells these three parables about lost things. Now the first mirror points out if a person is happy finding something they lost, how much more is God rejoicing when a sinner comes home? Or when the church, the, they reached out to people. God is overjoyed at this. And this should have been the attitude that the Pharisees had. And then this last parable, the mirror is reflecting their attitudes towards people. Lost people, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. See, this parable is, is so rich in what it reveals to us. We see the loving father, the lost son, the legalistic son who was just as lost as his younger brother. We love the, the welcome, the father who represents God, gives to the, to the wayward son. And see, that, that shows that there's hope for all of us. You see, we're all, we're all in that story. And maybe at times we're both of the boys. God is so waiting, waiting for us to return home that He welcomes us with open arms when we do. Now, before we think that there wasn't a cost, that just a simple apology or just simply returning home was all that there was, there was a cost to the grace that the Father gave. The death of the fatted calf was in essence a sacrifice. Just as there is a cost to the grace that we sang about earlier that God lavishes upon us, that Jesus welcomes us home from the cross. See, Jesus paid the price. So here's Here's the uh, welcome, the question for, for us. What kind of welcome will a prodigal receive when he or she comes to our church? So, who welcomed the wayward son? Who got, who got it right, let's say? Which, which of these two characters do you think is how God wants His church to welcome the unchurched? How will we welcome them home? Now, if we have turned our lives over to Jesus, that we have felt that welcome of the loving Father, and, and if that's the welcome that we've received, then that's how God wants us to welcome all the younger sons and daughters home. The church is, is the home for God's people. And, and it, it's where we all belong, it, it, all of God's sons and daughters. So we must make a concerted effort to show them the love that God has shown to us. See, the Pharisees made it difficult for anyone to be welcomed into God's kingdom. They tied all sorts of rules and, and legalistic burdens on them. And sadly, there are many in the churches in the world today that do the same thing. And here's our challenge. As we have left the United Methodist Church, many will see us as hating certain groups that we will not be welcoming. I read a lot this past year on the United Methodist Church clergy Facebook page where the liberals took pot shots at all those who left the United Methodist Church, that, that we are not showing love, that we hated certain groups, that we would not be welcoming of anybody anybody in any of those groups. Now, I believe that probably if we're honest, we do struggle with this. And maybe this is one of those come to Jesus moments where we analyze our own attitudes and thoughts. We might have trouble welcoming those who are not living a Christ-centered life. And that's what we have to work on. That's not the image or reputation that I believe 
we really are, that we embrace. What a wonderful thing it would be if others said of us, look at that church, they welcome sinners and they even eat with them. See, that's when we have to remember the welcome that each of us received from Jesus. When, when someone spoke to us with words of welcome and love. It's when we remember God's welcome through Christ. That that cross is, is a vertical and horizontal emblem. That it points us to God and it's, God says, I welcome you home. Come home. It, it, and it, it isn't that we all of a sudden have to try harder. Okay, I guess I'll just try harder at welcoming people. See, we can't. We really can't try harder. Because if, if we harbor any pharisaical things in our hearts, it's going to pop out. We just have to remember the welcome that we received. The welcome that each of us received. Now, it will likely be messy. There's no mention of a bath when that boy came home. He was covered by the Father. They, they say there's an exchange that took place. Christ took on humanity, our humanity. And the exchange is that we receive His righteousness. But Jesus calls us to the messy stuff of life. We often think that our, we're in a battle against other people. But the Bible reminds us that our battle is not against other people, but against those spiritual forces of darkness. See, the enemy is out there confusing minds and trying to destroy lives and confusing them about their identity and, and, and who they are. And it's the church's call to remind them that we are all created in the image of God. And we sometimes get off track. We sometimes wander into a far country. But there was something clicked in that boy's mind that I want to come home. Because this, this surely, this is not what, what I thought it would be. But at home. And, and what God's intention is for the church is that this is the home. This is the place where people can come and connect with God. So what kind of welcome will the prodigals receive from us? What will we do with those whom God brings our way? What will they hear us say? We must remember Jesus welcomed us home with open arms on the cross. So how can we do any different? So as we close, Joshua, you might, I think the battery's going out here. As we close this morning, where specifically do you feel God has spoken to you this past hour? What are the things that he's been speaking to you about? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for reaching down and taking hold of us, for rescuing us and being our support in the days of trouble. And if we're honest, how you delight in us is beyond our ability to grasp. So help us, Lord, to hear the song that you sing over us. Satisfy us this morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all day. May your favor rest upon us, Lord. 
And so we ask that you establish the work of our hands this day and may kingdom purposes be accomplished in and through our lives for our hope is in you, the maker of heaven and earth. You are our great reward and we praise your holy name. Amen. So, grace is getting what we don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense. It cost God everything to give us this grace. So how do we use it? How do we live into this grace? May it be something we experience this week as we seek to welcome those by showing Christ's love to the world around us. Go in peace.